Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Sam Tiltman. I work in Marsh's technology industry practice. Welcome to a special joint Marsh and RPC webcast today, focusing on technology mergers and acquisitions. First of all, I'd like to thank you, our attendees, for supporting today's session. This morning, we're joined by a highly diverse group of around 140 people from over 50 different companies across 12 countries, from around 15 different technology industry sectors, including telecoms, software and IT services, AI, cloud computing, intellectual property, fintech, e-commerce, etc., as well as a broad mixture of private equity, portfolio companies, banking, corporate finance, and other private and public corporations. Today's webinar is our response to the significant M&A activity of our clients, colleagues, and industry partners. Many corporations are involved in tech M&A activities, including major mergers, sell-offs, IPOs, delistings, and acquisitions. Technology has traditionally been a major M&A driver for the global economy, and this seems to have continued, even increased throughout such challenging times. Further to this, we're seeing evidence that the broader impact of COVID-19 is accelerating the declines and expansions of certain industries. And we're convinced that the tech sector will become even more important in due course. So today, our esteemed panel of M&A experts will delve deeper into tech M&A, what we're seeing, the practicalities of doing such deals and the related risk considerations. Lots of material to cover for sure. Rob, if I could move to the next slide, please. To introduce our panel, uh, we're composed of four tech M&A experts from RPC and our very own head of transaction risk at Marsh. David Cran is an IPM technology partner who specializes in tech transactions and disputes. We have Neil Brown, who advises clients on M&A and general corporate transactions. We have Peter Sugden, corporate lawyer with particular interest in early stage investments. James Mee, who specializes in corporate transactions in the financial services and insurance sector. And finally, Leo Flindel, who heads up Marsh's UK M&A transaction practice. Move to the next slide, please. Uh, before we begin, let's discuss Q&A. During the webinar, there will be the opportunity to engage in Q&A and interactive chat via the function in the Zoom taskbar. Uh, have a look at the bottom of your screen. Furthermore, we thank those attendees who have already provided some questions in advance of today's session. We've consolidated this into a list of around five to 10 key questions and we'll cover in a dedicated Q&A session at the end. However, do feel free to ask them as you go along. We will endeavor to respond either today, if not certainly afterwards. In addition, we will also be holding a couple of interactive poll surveys, which will automatically be presented via the Zoom app on your screen. So please feel free to respond. I'd now like to hand over to David, who will lead off our first session. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And thank you everyone uh, for joining us uh, today. Um, you know, as we've heard, tech M&A remains a very active and important part of the market, even as we see some deal volumes maybe slowing, particularly in Europe over the last six months. No signs of that in the tech M&A space. And indeed, as Sam has already indicated, if anything, we're seeing an uptick in activity. Um, so tech M&A is obviously a huge topic and extends across a wide number of sectors, as again, Sam has very helpfully outlined. So instead, what we're going to do today is look at some of the big issues that we've seen in our uh, tech M&A practice over the past six to 12 months and look at some of the trends, you know, with a real focus on addressing risks, and protecting and enhancing value. So what we're going to do, we're going to roughly break our part of the session into three. We're going to have a look at the tech M&A landscape initially, and Neil Brown is going to take us through some of the interesting macro issues that are affecting the tech market and M&A in particular. Uh, we're then going to look a little bit more about some of those trends that I mentioned in the M&A space, and Peter Sugden and James May are going to take us through that, with also a bit of um, discussion about, as we heard, you know, differences between maybe some early stage issues and some buyout issues. And then finally, I'm going to pick up um, some tech M&A risks on the claim side. Um, so both through the um, early stage of a transaction, through the documentation to post transaction. And that will hopefully then dovetail nicely into some of the insurance um, solutions that Leo will uh, talk about later. 
So um, we've got quite a lot to get through. So I'm going to immediately hand over to Neil Brown to take you through the tech M&A landscape. Thanks, David. Thanks very much. And hello, everybody. My name is Neil Brown, and I'm going to talk this morning about national security controls in tech M&A transactions. Where this is at is that um, the government is expected to produce a draft bill before Parliament setting out the proposed new legislation to give itself much wider and stronger powers to intervene in M&A transactions on national security grounds. As I say, these this is expected to be much broader than is currently the case and is likely to make quite a big change to the way in which certain tech M&A transactions can be done. There was a white paper published in July 2018 consulting on what that legislation might say. And in the Queen's speech in December of 2019, the government said it would be bringing forward that legislation during the current parliament. Um, so, so Rob, if you can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the background to this is, is quite well known, the current sort of geopolitical situation. That white paper is 150 pages long, and there's one word which doesn't appear anywhere in that white paper, and that word is China. But I think for all observers, it's fairly clear that actually what's driving this new legislation, both in the UK and actually similar legislation in other Western countries, is a concern that Chinese companies who are very closely linked with the Chinese government may get their hands on um, important pieces of tech. Uh, we're packing a lot into today's session, so I'm not going to go into these um, these geopolitical issues which we've got up on the slide there, because as I say, they're quite well quite well publicised in the in the press. So, so again, Rob, if you could please um, move on. Thank you. The current rules in the UK are set out in the Enterprise Act 2002, and the clue is in the name, both the 2002 because clearly the world has changed a lot since then, but also the Enterprise Act. And the fact is that the current national security rules in the UK are very much a footnote to um, competition law, enterprise law. Um, they're administered by the Competition and Markets Authority, and they are dependent on sort of strict thresholds around turnover and share of supply like you see in competition law. But anyway, we're not going to dwell on this. I think the more interesting topic is what we think the new rules are, are likely to say. So again, Rob, if you could please flick forward. Thank you. At, at the heart of this is a challenge to balance uh, the requirements of national security, or at least the perceived requirements of national security, um, with free trade. The UK has always been a country which is traditionally very open to free trade, um, open to inwards investment. So therefore, it, it slightly goes against the grain to be putting in sort of um, what you might call slightly sort of vague or ambiguous restrictions on that and in fact the UK will be one of the last sort of westernized countries to impose these these much more stringent um, requirements. One of the real difficulties is defining what is actually meant by by national security. It's quite a nebulous concept and we as sort of private citizens aren't actually privy to what you know MI5 or MI6 are, are thinking at any particular point in time. Even if it was something which was capable of being written down in any particularly precise way it probably wouldn't ever be written down for, well, security reasons. I think one thing which we can be reasonably confident about is that the new regime will not require mandatory pre-clearance of transactions. It's likely to be a voluntary regime whereby people can seek pre-clearance if they want to before a transaction. But the sting in the tail is that the government can then call on a transaction after the event. And if they don't like it, they can impose penalties, sanctions, or even ultimately unwind a transaction. So given the sort of the inherent vagueness as to what national security means, that's likely to have quite a chilling effect on transactions. And I think what you'll see is quite a lot of people doing deals will want to apply to get pre-clearance to know that they're not going to be retrospectively unwound. Um, I don't think people can assume that just because an acquirer on transaction is not from China, that automatically means it's okay. We, 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 again, we just don't know what the security services might think about particular parts of the world at any particular point in time. It's not clear that there'll necessarily be a sort of fast track process for known allied nations. I don't think it's going to be that prescriptive. It's going to be something which is a bit more sort of vague. This is also, today's seminar is about M&A, but these new rules are not just going to capture M&A transactions, they're going to capture something much broader in recognition that, you know, ownership in traditional sense is not the only way in which people can access technologies. So it's also going to capture, you know, IP licensing arrangements, supply chain arrangements, um, 
um, outsourcing deals. So I think the potential scope of these new rules can't be can't be underestimated. I think a good analogy is when we moved from the Data Protection Act 1998 to GDPR, something where a particular area of law just suddenly mushroomed very, very quickly in, in and had quite a big wide ranging impact. Another question is whether or not the rules will only look at national security or whether they'll also address what you might call broader public interest concerns. Traditionally, having powers to intervene on public interest is quite difficult under, under European law. But we, as, we, as the UK is going to be leaving um, European law very shortly, and we have a government that's very committed to that, will they be able to resist the temptation to give themselves the power in this legislation to intervene on more politically expedient reasons? For example, you know, loss of high school jobs from the UK. The final question I'd like to leave you with is, is the question of how is this going to be administered? We know that going forward, it's not going to be administered by the Competition and Markets Authority. The ultimate decision-making power is going to rest with the government acting through a Secretary of State. Will there be a new governmental body set up to administer this? If so, how is that going to be resourced at a time when, when public funds are, are fairly scarce? Uh, and how are they going to cope with, with the volume of applications that might come through? In the white paper, they, the government said they thought there might be 200 pre-clearance applications per year. But I think most people looking at this think that's probably going to be far too low a number because for the reasons I've said, the ambiguities, people are likely to want to see pre-clearance. And the danger there is that things will um, get stuck in the system. You have an under-resourced government um, organization that can't turn these things around fast enough. So there is the potential that you know, m and transactions, the tech sector um, may get slowed down by that. This is a fascinating topic, but as I say, we're, we're covering a lot today. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Peter, who's going to talk about some more of the deal issues that we see on tech m and deals. Yeah, thank you, Neil. And, and, and as you say, having looked at one of the really key macro trends in tech m and James and I thought it'd be interesting to get a bit more granular and explore some of the deal specific issues that we've seen coming up with increasing regularity, really, over the past, past 12 to 24 months in the tech m and space. And we'll go through just a few of them as we've highlighted on this slide and hope that it'll be useful in terms of um, suggesting what, what might be useful to look for in terms of acquiring a tech company, but also on the other side of the, co the coin, how to protect against value destruction if you're selling or raising investment for a tech company. So the first issue I wanted to deal with was intellectual property and, and the use of source code. On your standard non-tech M&A deal where software isn't really driving value, it wouldn't be uncommon, uh, uncommon for a purchaser to rely primarily on warranty protection to get comfort on the IP use in the business. But needless to say, on tech deals, one of the key questions to be answered during due diligence is whether or not the target owns or has sufficient rights to use all of the material IP rights that underpin, underpin the target software product. And there are three issues here that we see regularly. Firstly, ownership of code, and, and this derives primarily from the fact that code is, of course, written by individuals. So it's really key to make sure that in the employment contract or consultancy agreement uh, for the person developing the code, it's, it's very clearly set out that the code fits with the company and not with the individual who's developed it. Secondly, whether the software incorporates any open source software within it. And the reason why this is key is because some open source software licenses can oblige the user of the open source to make derived works freely available under the terms of the license. Tech MA in, in the US in particular routinely performs open source audits um, using third party scanners and, and, and they can sort of help highlight um, open source. And thirdly, whether the target software is dependent on third party licensing IP. And if so, whether the licenses give the target secure rights to exploit the software in the manner which the buyer wants. And also the extent to which the target is at risk of losing those rights going forward. Sorry, I just um, I'm going to cough. Sorry, so some or all of these issues come up in almost all the tech m and deals we work on, and buyers are increasingly alive to them from an, from an early stage. The next issue I wanted to deal with was around cap tables. And uh, on a share acquisition, it, it is, of course, key to establish the ownership position of the shares being acquired. And often that's quite straightforward. The tech companies regularly have a slightly more complex shareholder body, and that's due to a couple of reasons, really. Firstly, many tech companies are founded by are funded by venture or great capital investment, which often puts layer upon layer of different share classes and share conversion rights and liquidation preferences into play. And secondly, the incredible growth potential of uh, successful tech companies mean they regularly try to attract most talented employees by offering 
incentivization packages based around options and equity ownership rather than high base salaries. Now, the combination of these two things often results in a share register or a cap table that's quite complex. And, and we've seen a lot of deals recently where a so-called broken cap table has been really destructive of value. Just to pick up a few real life examples of this on recent deals, um, we've had situations of economic dilution where founders have granted investors a guaranteed return through preference shares and end up with next to nothing themselves on an exit event. We've had oral contracts where as an exit looms, employees sometimes come out of the woodwork and allege that they were promised shares or that the loans they made to the business were, were supposed to be convertible loans. We've had rounding errors, which might seem quite mundane, but, but actually when you have a cap table which is put through Excel, it could automatically round up share numbers and, and that becomes quite a, a nightmare to unpick. And we also have examples of large shareholder pools where a very large shareholder body can pose some quite significant logistical problems on, on an exit event. So in short, the broken or the messy cap table isn't something which is particular to tech M&A, but which comes up an awful lot in our experience and can be really destructive of value uh, when you get to an exit event. And James, I know that's something that you've seen really quite a lot of in terms of the buyout stage of investments. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Pete. Hello, everybody. Um, as, as David mentioned earlier, I, I'm going to make a few observations about later stage and buyout transactions. And picking up on, on some of Pete's comments, uh, cap tables and deal structuring, uh, well, they become ever more complicated as a company grows, uh, goes through several rounds of investment. Of course, by the time we get to a later stage transaction, there may well be many different instruments through which funds, founders, employees hold their economic interest. Uh, so the points Pete's raised there about cap tables become ever more important. And as Pete mentioned, um, whilst this isn't of course specific to tech, um, a slew of deals in recent years has actually reminded us of the, the real need to focus on the instruments through which investors, founders and others hold their shares. Um, hold their interest rather. Um, the valuation at which those instruments are required, um, elections required under local legislation, and the tax implications for different stakeholders. Um, all, all of these factors are incredibly important to uh, value when you come into later stage transactions. Just broadening out slightly, um, thinking about due diligence. Um, in the current deal environment, due diligence exercises, well, they seem to have become ever more comprehensive. Deals have been done throughout this year, um, including uh, through lockdown. Uh, by what well, tends to have been done, the deals that have been done tend to have been done by what I'd describe as the real expert buyers, um, both trade and private equity. And on all of those processes that, uh, that we've been involved with, extensive um, and very focused due diligence is a prerequisite. And Pete's mentioned intellectual property. Um, I've just touched on tax. We could spend an entire session on any of these aspects, um, but if I'm allowed to offer one takeaway, it, it's the need for a real focus on IP, data, tax, and all other relevant issues as a company grows in order to de-risk future transactions and avoid any value destruction. A final comment on due diligence processes generally, I, I'd simply mention that in this environment, they do seem to be as involved as ever. The demands on time and the process itself need to be factored into any timetable. And it's particularly the case on later stage transactions where uh, insurance solutions are increasingly used. In fact, I don't think I've seen a deal done this year without an insurance solution. Now, David and Leo will make a few further observations on risk issues and the insurance solutions available. Um, but before handing over to David, the one other issue I'd mention on later stage transactions uh, is valuation gaps and how to bridge them. I think everybody participating in this webinar um, will be very familiar with the use of earnouts and deferred consideration. They're certainly very much in vogue. What we've been seeing recently is a real focus on definitions, um, earnings, EBITDA, revenue targets, often tracking the headline deal multiples. And the importance of how these matters are defined um, can't be overstated. On a number of recent projects, we've seen potentially huge valuation swings, depending upon whether or not an item is recognized. Um, and David, I think I will wrap at that point and hand over to you. Thanks very much, James. Um, 
so we've obviously seen a little bit of the landscape and we've obviously now heard from uh, Pete and Jim some of the issues, the common deal issues. We just thought it'd be worth translating that into the classic tech M&A timeline, which is, we've obviously simplified for these purposes. But as we've heard from James uh, and from Peter around the importance of ownership of IP and BD, that due diligence stage in tech M&A in particular uh, is hugely important. Uh, and probably the big difference maybe between tech M&A and other forms of due diligence is there's a much greater weight uh, placed on the technical due diligence. You know, uh, what you are actually buying is often driven by the underlying technology or the software. And so that technical due diligence obviously assumes much greater importance. Um, and that should be properly integrated into both your financial and your legal due diligence as well. Uh, just picking up on a point that James made as well. I think it's important to recognize that it's quite difficult to put these companies in good shape if you're only looking at these issues for the first time on the cusp of a transaction. And certainly when you're on the seller side, having a well-run, tidy up and almost pre-due diligence exercise is really healthy. And similarly, when you're on the buyer side, you can see the difference between a well-run, well-organized company and someone who is trying to plug the gaps. So, you know, there may even be a pre-pre-transaction stage that um, sellers should be thinking of. And moving through mitigating risk, well, this is really, you've now looked under the bonnet, if you like, you've seen the potential risks that are in this particular company, or you're looking at the wider market and you're aware of the risks that are available in the sectors. And this is where really you now start to try and mitigate these risks, partly through to the transaction documents. So you would see warranties, often looking at general, more generalized risks um, and indemnities trying to address the specific risks that have come up through the due diligence uh, process. And a lot of this is about allocating risk between sellers and buyers. And as Leo, I think, will touch on, the advantage of a lot of these insurance solutions is it moves us away from that very binary discussion of which of the two parties or the, to the transaction should be bearing those risks. Uh, we mentioned ancillary documents because they're often very important in tech M&A because they can be used to plug gaps, whether it be confirmatory IP assignments, whether there be additional third party licenses to perhaps um, extend the scope, not just of what the business currently does, but what you want the new or integrated business to do. Uh, regulatory issues, as we've heard, are hugely important in tech M&A. We've heard from Neil about government intervention hovering over the horizon but also the competition authorities. Obviously, there's a lot of very big tech players. And of course, uh, as we'll come on to, uh, data protection regulation, uh, which are now real players in their own right. I mentioned insurance, we'll obviously hear more from Leo, but obviously warranty and indemnity insurance in particular is one of the huge growth areas in M&A, but again, particularly tech and M&A, given often the nature of the ownerships and the transactions. And then when we look to post-transaction, well, it's obviously a truism of all M&A that integration often decides whether you have a successful M&A process. So that's a hugely important part of both addressing and managing risks and of course, adding to value. And similarly, further transactions. And again, some of this may be building on what you've acquired. So it may be bolt-ons. Some of it may be addressing potential issues, additional licenses, getting new technologies. And some, of course, has been driven by the regulators themselves. And so you see very significant divestments, which leads to another flurry of tech M&A activity. And we can see that even within the last few days, the very significant London stock exchange uh, transaction to acquire Refinitiv has in turn led to the LSE being required to offload Borsa Italiana. Um, I see that that's now been announced that Euronext and LSE have actually agreed that as a 4.3 billion euro uh, M&A deal in its own right. So, and then of course claims, um, which we will come to. But before I come on to claims, we thought we'd look at one other issue that is obviously huge within the tech M&A landscape at the moment, and that is data. So it's a well-worn analogy, of course, now that data is the new oil, um, and certainly there to a certain extent, the analogy runs true. You know, it's certainly fueling the global economy uh, at the moment. Um, I think people often say it's only useful if it's refined in some way. 
And of course, what we'll also be looking at today is that you have leakages or spills. Uh, and when that happens, it does make a terrible mess and it's often very expensive to clean up. Um, the difference with the analogy is probably that the great thing about data is it doesn't look like it's going to run out. In fact, if anything, it's growing at perhaps an exponential rate. So, and we're probably only tapping uh, the surface of what we can do with um, data. But having said that, we have also got data regulation. And that is on the rise. Um, Neil mentioned in his introduction about uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, which I'm sure all of us are very familiar with now. But it's not just in Europe. You know, the US, traditionally a bit more less interventionist on such issues, you know, now has the California Consumer Privacy Act, the CCPA, which has very similar features, or a number of similar features to the GDPR. And of course, you have regulators looking at it from a competition aspect as well. You, you can see that from the Google Fitbit transaction, where the concessions being given are not your typical divestment style concessions, but it's instead that Google are offering to make the data they acquire from that transaction freely available to others in the market. So there's a recognition that there's a very significant value attached to this data. It's driving many of the biggest deals, but also very significant risk. And you know, we've got a few examples of that, as we've seen, you know, going back even a few years. In 2017, Verizon acquired Yahoo. And as part of that due diligence, Yahoo disclosed that it had two breaches in previous years. Well, that resulted in a price chip of about 7%. Or three hundred and fifty million dollars. So that's a that's a very significant risk translating directly into value and erosion of value. And of course, to bring us up to current date, we have the ICO notices of intention to fine. So British Airways, approximately one hundred eighty-three million. Marriott, approximately ninety-nine million. Both of those are obviously under review still, but it shows how these regulators have really sharpened their teeth. And now, of course, that's not the end of it, because that then often only leads on to the next stage, which are the major representative actions. We've seen uh, actions such as Morrison's, uh, Equifax, both in the US and the UK, um, Lloyd, Google, which the Supreme Court will consider in April next year. So a huge amount of activity on the data side. Um, if we just then move on to claims, and uh, there's a few uh, themes that you'll have seen that we've mentioned as we've moved through. So deferred consideration or not, as Jim says, crucial to get it right up front. Um, but there are some real almost uh, systemic issues with these arrangements because you're often valuing a target and trying to assess how it has performed in the earn out period. But often it's already been integrated into the main buy group. So how do you easily value that? Um, what happens if the benefit or growth of the company is not down to the target or the founders, but rather to the buyout group? How is that reflected in the earn out? So as Jim says, when you see such huge swings in these valuations, it often leads to disagreements between buyers and sellers as to where the consideration should flow or how much should flow. Uh, revenue recognition, I mentioned because it never really goes out of fashion in relation to tech uh, uh, deals. The most recent example is autonomy, of course, which is HP um, effectively saying that autonomy's revenues have been increased by recognizing tech deals early into the books. Uh, and this goes all the way back to WorldCom and the like, when a lot of the revenue recognition rules were tightened up. Um, third, pi third party IP infringement, again, going back to what Pete mentioned in terms of fundamental where IP is driving so much of the value in these deals that you ensure that you have all of the IP you need to operate, not just of the target you're acquiring, but also what you want to do in the future. And the big issues that we see continue to be US patent driven issues, big markets, big values, big risks, um, open source software, and in particular copy left provisions, where the incorporation of open source can require proprietary software incorporating that to be made available on the same open source, generally available terms. Um, 
and creators and developers coming out of the woodwork either at the time of a transaction or shortly afterwards, claiming they have a slice of the IP. Uh, and particularly when that IP has just been valued, it often crystallizes the dispute. And, and finally, just very briefly to talk about third party licenses. A lot of these issues should be fleshed out and identified at the due diligence stage. The two issues that we see though are often the due diligence identifying sufficient scope of license for use of the business as it's been operated. But you really do need to understand what the future intentions of the business are and have one eye on the horizon when you're doing this due diligence. So scope of license is very important. And also um, the growth and continued growth in software and IP audits. Um, you know, these are very much here to stay, particularly from the big rights holders. We're seeing them be run across, uh, a rule being run across businesses regularly in any event. But often they look out for big transactions as well. And it often triggers a software audit. And they want to see whether you are using within scope or starting to stretch beyond scope, which obviously leads to additional license fees. So, uh, I will now hand over to Leo, who I think is going to pick up some of these themes and put it in the context of the uh, various insurance solutions that are now out there to allocate and mitigate some of these risks. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and, and thank you to the rest of the RPC team for giving us some of those insights into some of the risks and themes and challenges that we're seeing M&A participants have to work through and face as they're going through for M&A transactions. Um, so if we can move on to the agenda, Rob, um, I'm going to cover three key themes around how insurance capital can support and facilitate M&A transactions. Um, the first is using insurance to create shareholder value and protect value from the perspective of a buyer. Um, I then want to cover some grounds exploring how insurance capital can be used to solve some of the transactional issues that the RPC team have spoken to in the first half of this presentation. And then I want to, to talk a little bit about risk assessments. How do we understand the risks that are within businesses that we're either looking to dispose of or we're looking to acquire? And how do we understand the economic impact of those risks and how well they're managed? And then how do we carry that through to evaluation of that business? Um, so Rob, if we can move to the first slide. Um, so before I jump into those three themes, um, I wanted to give a little bit of context around the M&A insurance market. Now, the M&A insurance market is a market that has existed for about 20 years, um, but it's only in the last eight or so years that we really start to see this product be used regularly in an M&A transactional context. And what you can see here is the growth of the use of these products over the course of that period. And for me, this is a very interesting slide or very interesting graph because it shows that these products are being used increasingly regularly and with greater effect to help us navigate some of these risk issues. And as David mentioned, tech m &A is booming. And from our perspective, we advise across all sectors, but technology transactions are by far and away the single largest single sector to, in which we see these products being deployed. So very relevant to how technology deals are being structured and are being negotiated. Um, so Rob, if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, so when we look at the, the insurance universe around M&A transactions, um, typically we think about it in two ways. We think about the unknown and unforeseen risks. What are the risks that we know a business is exposed to, but we're not aware of particular issues? We have a risk of a risk, so to speak. And the second area is the known and quantifiable issues. And this is where we may be looking at a particular transaction and we know the business has a risk or has an issue that we can understand the parameters of that risk and make an assessment of it. And I'm gonna to touch on the unknown risks first under our theme of creating shareholder value and protecting risks for buyers. And then when we look at the known risks, I'm going to look at some of the specific insurance solutions that can be utilized to solve some of the tech M&A risks that the RPC team spoke to. So when we talk about unknown and unforeseen risks, the, the product that we often talk about in that context, and both James and David mentioned this product, is warranty and indemnity insurance. And 
in most simplest terms, warranty indemnity insurance is effectively a replacement route of recourse for breach of warranty or call under a tax deed. So the policy reacts in exactly the same way the SPA would react should there be circumstances within the target business that breaches a warranty. With the one difference being under the policy, you would recover that claim from the insurer against their balance sheet with no involvement from the seller. Whereas in an uninsured transaction and a much more traditional uh, contractual liability structure, you'd be making that recovery from the seller or the warrantors. Now, if we move to the next slide, Rob, what does that mean in terms of creating value for, for sellers and how does that help buyers get risks done? So to begin with, let's focus on a seller's perspective. And David mentioned one of the key points of discussion in any transaction is the negotiation of liability between the parties. Who carries the risk of the unknown and unforeseen issues? Now, a buyer understandably will want to buy the business with as much warranty protection as they can get. A broad set of warranties that warrant the statements of fact that the buyer uses to underpin their valuation. Now, a seller wants to give as few of those warranties as possible, and particularly, they want to minimize their financial exposure for those businesses. And absence an insurance policy, a, a very common structure would be the seller gives the warranties to a buyer, and the seller remains liable for a period of up to seven years to an amount of, say, 20% of the transaction value meaning that whilst on completion, the buyer receives the full consideration or may receive part of that consideration with the remainder going into an escrow account, they are still potentially on the hook for any of those warranties being incorrect for that period of 10 years. So understandably, the sellers push back very aggressively against that form of structure. So where we see the warranty indemnity insurance being used to create value for a seller, is we typically structure a transaction whereby the seller will still give a customary set of warranties and will undergo a typical and fulsome disclosure process against those warranties. But with one key difference, the seller will cap their liability at a pound, which for the seller is a fantastic position because it means whilst they are giving the warranties, they have no financial liability for those warranties, meaning that upon completion, they receive the full amount of the consideration and can walk away from the deal. That, however, is not a fantastic position for a buyer because whilst they get the benefit of the warranties, in the event that one of those warranty statements that the seller has given has been incorrect, and because of that breach, the buyer has effectively overpaid for the business, they have no route of recourse. So we use the WNI insurance product to bridge the gap between those two positions, allowing the seller to walk away with no residual liability for breach of warranty, but with the buyer taking out an insurance policy, which may be paid for by either party, depending on the commercial discussion, that gives the buyer route of recourse, meaning effectively both parties get the best of both worlds. The seller doesn't take any liability for breach of warranty, but in the event that the buyer has overpaid for a business because the factual assumptions they've used to underpin the valuation were incorrect, they can recover that loss from the insurer. And this dynamic is one we're seeing play out increasingly more in the, in the current M&A market, where in the most part, it's a very seller driven market. Lots of competition for multiple buyers to buy businesses uh, and sellers running very competitive auction processes. And we often see the seller introducing this product into a sale process, effectively meaning if a buyer wants to acquire that business and wants the benefit of warranty protection, their only choice is to purchase insurance. insurance, And that's very much a trend we've seen played out in the last two years. And I think James mentioned uh, he hasn't seen a transaction in recent times where that sort of structure with an insurance backed recourse position hasn't been put in place. From a seller's perspective and picking up on one of those other themes um, that was spoken to early in the presentation was forced divestitures. Lots of regulatory focus and competition focus on businesses being acquired. And we're seeing more of that as we see bigger businesses look to bolster their business to trade through the what I can call the COVID environment. Where those businesses are being, where, sorry, where the buyer is being forced to divest some of those businesses they're acquiring, that can create a difficult situation for a, for a buyer who then becomes a seller. Because they still want to give the benefit of the warranties to the buyer, 
in order to give the buyer confidence to proceed with the transaction and apply the highest valuation they can to that business. But they've only just acquired this, this business, so they don't have the knowledge to feel comfortable giving those warranties. And this is where the insurance product again comes into play, where effectively we can move that obligation and liability from the buyer come seller into the insurance market, meaning that again, a seller can bridge the gap between what they want from the transaction and what the buyer wants from a transaction. From a buyer's perspective, it's these products are generally used about managing risk. And again, we solve that question around risk allocation. Uh, risk allocation. We effectively streamline the negotiation between which party bears the risk for those unknown issues within the business. We transfer it to the insurance market. But some of the key trends that are specific to technology businesses where these products start to solve those problems are firstly, James mentioned um, you often have a, a seller structure or a shareholder structure where you have a large pool of shareholders. Now, absent an insurance product and in a more customary position where the shareholders are jointly standing behind the warranties, that means a buyer has a fairly complex process of recovering from a large number of multiple parties for small amounts. So in those situations, we often see an insurance policy place for the benefit of the buyer, meaning that in the event of a breach of warranty, they have, a, they have one route of recourse against one counterparty meaning that they only have to pursue one claim. And the second dynamic I, I want to touch on is we often see these transactions being structured with management of that business staying with the business. And often in particularly the earlier stage, high growth technology businesses, management are key to driving forward the growth in that business. And often it's those individuals, the management of the business who will give the warranties. Now, as a buyer, you may come in and acquire a business with that management team being comfortable giving you the warranties. And often we see the dynamic where, because it's their business, they know it very well, they feel very comfortable giving those statements. Now, if we move forward a couple of months to after completion and a buyer identifies that one of those warranties are incorrect. In a customary contractual position, you would then be making that recovery from the warrantors i.e. the management team, in a personal capacity. Now, for a buyer, that puts you in a very difficult position because this management team are now your management team and they are the stewards of your investment. And seeking to recover a loss from them in a personal capacity um, could be described as a, a, a pretty quick way to, to, to ruin your relationship with your management team. So we often see, and particularly private equity buyers, structuring uh, transactions whereby they have the management giving the warranties. And importantly, they still keep the management liable for those warranties because the buyer wants those individuals to have some skin in the game. It gives the buyer confidence pursuing, uh, so um, proceeding with the transaction. But they buy the insurance in the background to give them an alternative route of recourse. And in that situation, it's entirely at the buyer's discretion whether they want to seek recovery from the warrantors or from the insurance company. But the benefit in that situation is where there has been an innocent breach of warranty, it means the buyer can recover their loss from the insurer and leave their management team to do what they bought that management team to do, to keep running and to grow their business. And finally, just to touch on a couple of key issues we see that are typically unknown at the time of acquisition, where warranty indemnity insurance gives protection to a buyer and gives them confidence proceeding. Um, David talked about third party licenses and increasing propensity of the large software providers to audit businesses for uh, appropriate license use and having the, the right amount of licenses for the business. And I completely agree with that comment. And that is one of the areas where we see a lot of claims activity at the moment. And we're seeing claims paid in the market relating to those types of issues. Subject to having done an appropriate diligence on third party licenses, that is a type of exposure that to the extent it's warranted, which it would be customarily, uh, the insurance would, pro would provide protection in that respect. And to touch on one other key risk issue that's often unknown at the time of acquisition is ownership of source code. And this goes right to the heart of value. And again, subject to doing a customary due diligence process, that is typically an exposure that, again, to the extent it's warranted, which it would be customarily, would be covered under that type of policy. So that broadly captures where insurance plays a role in allocating 
responsibility and liability for the unknown risks. Uh, and often this is used as a tool to streamline negotiations. But often when we're looking at making an acquisition, we also have an understanding of issues that are known within the business. And known issues are, are excluded from warranty indemnity insurance. The policy is there to cover the unknown and unforeseen losses at the time of the acquisition. So how can we solve some of those issues? So Rob, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, so starting with tax, tax is relevant to every business, um, but there are particular tax uh, exposures that are very relevant to a technology business. And we often see these being key points of contention between a buyer and a seller. And where this product is typically used is where the parties are aware of an identified issue that is contingent in some respect, in that it is yet to crystallize. Now, a buyer may want to seek a contractual indemnity from a seller, um, but often these businesses are sold by way of competitive auction processes. And the challenge for a buyer is they don't necessarily want to seek that indemnity from the seller for fear of prejudicing their position, their competitive positioning as part of that auction process. So how do they get comfortable with that risk? Do they just take the risk on? Do they price chip, which then again may disadvantage their competitive positioning as part of the process? Or can the insurance market provide a role to solve that solution? And where tax insurance solves these issues are where we've identified a tax risk, where it's a case of interpretation. Uh, I'm afraid you can't insure incorrect tax. If you've got it wrong, then that is a commercial issue that the business will need to solve. But this is typically where we've looked at a, a tax structure or a tax position. And when we apply the relevant tax legislation to that issue, we're of the view that we think this company has got it right. But the risk is that HMRC or the relevant tax authority may challenge that position, or they may interpret the legislation in a slightly different way, which if they did, a tax liability would then arise. Um, so these insurance policies are used to ring fence those contingent tax risks, meaning that neither seller nor buyer need to take responsibility for that risk. So the seller, again, can walk away from a transaction with no contingent liability by way of an indemnity they're given to the buyer. And the buyer has the protection that they can get the transaction through an investment committee sign off or they don't need to disadvantage their position as part of an auction process. And good examples where this product has been used to good effect in technology transactions. And James spoke to founder tax issues relating to the day one valuation of the shares and financial instru uh, instruments that management and the founders own their equity within the business. And this is a risk that is very much insurable with some simple um, independent verification work that can be conducted at the time of the transaction, where if we are relatively confident that we've applied an appropriate valuation to those instruments, the insurers will take the risk of HMRC or the relevant tax authority taking a different view and will pick up the tax liability in the event they did take that view. And just to cover a couple of other tax risks, which we see regularly uh, being a topic of conversation in technology transactions, uh, risks around the approach to withholding tax on dividends, royalties and dividends, uh, substantial shareholding exemption type risks. This is a type risk that we see insured very regularly. And also for some businesses where they have a multi-jurisdictional holding um, structure, which isn't unusual where you have some form of institutional capital as a current investor or shareholder in a business, providing economic certainty that that residency structure isn't going to be challenged, uh, where if it was successfully challenged, a tax liability would then arise. It's also worth noting, just while we're talking about tax and rolling back to the unknown and unforeseen coverage that's provided under a WNI insurance policy, that a WNI insurance policy will typically cover a pre-completion tax indemnity, giving the buyer protection and certainty that if post-completion a tax liability arises that relates to the pre-completion period, they have protection for that matter that is again transferred to the insurance market. Rob, if we can move to the next slide, please. So tax is relevant to every business uh, and it is a key financial exposure for most businesses. But when we look at technology businesses and specifically, I think every participant on this webinar so far has spoken to IP and how it goes straight to the value of the business fundamentally. So for a buyer, their key concern is going to be, 
do we have protection and do we have confidence that we have the IP that we think we're buying? Because without that IP, it's very value destructive. And what we've acquired diverges significantly from the, the consideration we paid for that business. Now, when we think about IP risk, there's three ways we can think about it. Um, the first is what I like to call the unknown and ongoing IP risk. And by that, we mean um, risks associated with third party infringement on the IP assets of the business around, for example, digital rights, licenses, patents, trade secrets, copyrights, for etc. Now, most businesses where they have appropriate insurance policies and appropriate insurance programs in place that reflect what that business does and their exposure to IP should have some form of protection around their operational insurance program. So it's important to understand how does that business ensure that risk on an ongoing basis before you acquire the business, because that can go quite go directly to value. And I'm going to touch on how we understand that in more detail on the next slide. The second is around when we have concerns around the ownership of the IP issue or where there is ongoing litigation uh, around the business's IP. And where we see these type of issues um, arise in transactions is where we look at the IP assets of the business and we're generally comfortable with the position, but there is some concern that there is a low risk issue that for whatever reason, be it um, a contractual transfer, be it an indemnity to a third party, or be it the application of intellectual property legislation, there is a risk that that, that IP may not vest within the business. And, in a similar way to contingent tax insurance, there are products available within the m and insurance market called contingent intellectual property insurance. And this ensures the application of the legislation or regulation that applies to those IP assets. And in the extent that there is a legal challenge to the ownership of that IP, products can be structured that effectively respond to an adverse outcome of that litigation. Typically in situations where we've taken a, a fulsome set of legal advice on the outcome of that litigation and our view and our perspective and the opinion from your legal advisors is that this litigation is ongoing, but we have a good view on this. Um, so where the, where the opinion from your legal advisors is that we think we will be successful in either the defense or offense, depending on what the situation is. And in the event that that's not the case, the product would respond to effectively indemnify you for the loss of value within the business. And finally, we have the litigation funding type aspects. And this is either where, as a business, you own IP that you believe third parties are infringing on. And to protect the value in your business, you need to effectively litigate against those parties to prevent them from using your IP but particularly relevant to early stage high growth businesses where your cash flow may be relatively low. You don't have the funding available or the free cash flow in the business enabled to be able to pursue um, those cases and stop those third parties infringing on your IP. And there are insurance products that are available to effectively fund that litigation to enable you to create, to protect the value within your business, but where you don't have the cash flow to do it off your own balance sheet. And similarly, we see the same approach from a defensive perspective, where your IP is challenged and you are confident that that IP is yours, but you don't necessarily have the free cash flow in order to fund the defense against that, um, that offensive litigation. There are insurance products that are available that will fund, will fund your defense of that third party's claim, allowing you to protect the value within the business and defend that claim, knowing that that IP is yours and this claim is effectively a spurious claim. If you move to the next slide, please, Rob. Um, so we've covered how we deal with the unknown issue, uh, the unknown risks and how insurance can bridge that gap between the seller position and the buyer position. And in the last few slides, we covered some of the technology specific insurance products that solve known issues within transactions, which brings us on to the third theme we wanted to talk to. And this is understanding the risks within the business, how those risks are managed, mitigated and transferred, and how that goes to value of the business. Um, so I want to touch on two diligence work streams that, from our perspective, are key in that, concept, uh, that context, cyber due diligence and insurance due diligence. So starting with cyber, this is a non-insurance related uh, diligence work stream 
that is specifically targeting at allowing a buyer to understand the cyber risk that sits within the business. And it effectively gets broken down into five aspects. The first is identifying the risks within the business. A, as a buyer, do you understand how this business is exposed to data breaches, cybersecurity issues, and loss of value through unauthorized access to your systems and to your business? And crucially, does the business understand it? And from a buyer, buyer's perspective, where these data issues and these cyber issues, again, go directly to value, it's important to understand whether the business understands those risks and manages them appropriately. Because if not, it will likely involve a significant amount of capital expenditure within the business to effectively bring that business up to where as a buyer, you would want it from a cyber and data protection perspective. And that can go straight to EBITDA and straight to value. Cyber diligence will also assess how are these risks protected within the business. And that can be assessed through different mechanisms. Some will be operational risk controls and risk protocols. What does the business do to stop unauthorized access to its systems? And what does the business do to mitigate the risk of inadvertent and unauthorized uh, data release outside of the confines of the business? And is that appropriate for that business? And again, do we need to invest to bring that up to where we are confident that business is effectively managing those, those risks? Does the business have a system in place to help identify a cyber risk uh, breach or data breach event? And this is effectively addressing, addressing the issues where we may have a data breach, but we don't identify that this has happened to a significant period of time after it's happened. So from a response perspective to solving that issue and protecting the data that has been released from a business and protecting the re reputational risks that are associated with a data breach, identifying that that event has taken place quickly puts the business into the best position to be able to solve the issue rather than a significant period of time passing before we begin to solve and address that issue. And then finally, it makes an assessment of how does the business respond to that issue? Do they have business recovery uh, procedures in place that allow the business to continue trading? Or will the business simply be able to unable to trade as they work through this issue? Um, one of the key risks and exposures to a business in relation to a cyber issue or a data breach issue is, a re is the reputational loss of for example, a systemic distribution of client data. So do you understand, is a business prepared for that situation? Do we need to invest to ensure that in the event that there is a cyber event or a data breach, the business is well prepared to deal with it, both from a reputational perspective and also a business continuity perspective. And then finally, an assessment of how the business recovers from that situation once we've solved the short-term impacts. And cyber diligence is, is, is a key diligence work stream when we look at businesses in the technology space because cyber risk and data go straight to value. Uh, and David spoke about the importance of data within businesses in this sector. So it's important to ensure it's protected. And it's also important as a buyer to ensure that you have a good understanding of how aware a business is of their exposures in this respect and how they manage, mitigate and transfer those issues. And part of that will be understanding how are, those, how are those risks managed operationally and how are those risks transferred to the insurance market? Um, and there are aspects of both of those two types of mitigation and transfer that are very important in a best-in-class management of cyber and data risk. And if we move to the next slide, please, Rob. Um, and finally, insurance due diligence. And this is important, particularly in the context of technology businesses, for, for different reasons. Um, you know, we've taught through this webinar how IP is fundamental to the value of a business. And some of the protection around IP should be uh, delivered by way of the target's own operational insurance program. And a targeted and tailored insurance program that is tailored to a business in the technology sector is really what a business needs to ensure that they have that protection around their IP ownership. And of course, a much broader range of exposures, but particularly in the context of IP. Tech businesses are often fast growing um, and they have complex risks that aren't always fully assessed and understood. And it's very easy for an insurance program for a business in this sector, as it goes through a high growth phase to effectively be left behind. And it's not continually updated and tailored to reflect the business as it goes through each stage of its growth. 
So from a value protection perspective and insurance diligence of how particularly the IP and the professional negligence exposures are covered by way of a technology errors and omissions policy is an important assessment to make because without that protection, you carry a fundamental risk of value destruction. And secondly, insurance diligence is important for understanding the cost of risk within the business. What are the risks, what are the costs of risk transfer, but also what are the costs of the risk, uh, sorry, the costs of the claims that are running through the business to the extent that they're either held on the business's balance sheet or they're transferred to the insurance market. And again, these types of risks and costs go straight to EBITDA, so they go straight to valuation. So understanding those issues, how the business transfers risk to the insurance market and ensuring it does so in an appropriate way is important from a risk protection perspective, but also making that assessment from a valuation perspective enables you as a buyer to ensure that you're applying the correct valuation to a business. And finally, Rob, if we can move on to the final slide. Um, so we've covered those three themes um, that we talked through at the start of um, my slot. And I just wanted to touch on what happens when it all goes wrong and where do we see the risks and the claims being, being made. Um, so this data is, is formed across our book of M&A insurance products. And it gives a good overview into what are we seeing the issues that are arising post-completion as a direct result of M&A activity. Now, financial statements and tax issues are by far and away the most common issues. And part of that is because the accounts go straight to value. If there's an issue in the accounts, and because of that, for example, EBITDA is underreported, or sorry, is overreported, that will often have a direct implication on the appropriateness of the valuation that was applied to this business. So we see lots of claims in, that, in, in those areas, simply because it goes to the heart of economic value. Tax, um, as it was once described to me, is an art rather than a science. Um, so we often see uh, multiple tax issues arising out of M&A transactions, which we're seeing buyers pursue claims under their M&A insurance products. And particularly where we see the issues are around VAT issues of roughly half our, our tax uh, claims. And secondly, um, in relation to withholding tax issues in relation to the share sale taxes. Uh, and again, the latter being relevant for very relevant for businesses being sold and acquired in this sector. And, and I think just to touch on this claims profile from a technology lens, um, two of the fastest growing areas where we've seen claims in the last 12 months have been around litigation warranties, uh, challenging contracts between the target business and third parties. Uh, and as David spoke to earlier in the, the presentation, breaching of breaches of third party licenses. And we've seen really significant activity from the third party software providers coming into businesses to go through that audit process of ensuring that the businesses have the appropriate licenses for the volumes of software they use. Um, and what we're seeing in those circumstances is in a lot of cases, those businesses don't have the appropriate licenses, which then is a direct impact on the business, both from a fine perspective, but also the cost of that software then increases on an ongoing basis which is a direct EBITDA impact, which then goes straight to value. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of claims in that activity, in, in that area. And so I think that brings my, my session to an end. And we've, we've touched on how we can use insurance to solve some of the unknown issues around risk allocation in a transactional context. We've explored some of the solutions that are available for the technology specific issues that are often identified as part of an M&A transaction. And we've also talked through some of the key considerations from a risk and insurance perspective from a, a pre-acquisition due diligence process. Um, so as that brings my session to an end, um, I will pass over to Sam for any Q&A for the panel. Thanks, Leo. Also, thanks, uh, David, Neil, Peter and James. Uh, very insightful and certainly uh, a lot to think about. I think it's great to really understand some of those macro trends but also draw down into practical experience, what we're seeing, those trends, but also about how far insurance can go to help facilitate some of these deals, but also thinking further ahead into what the future has in store. Um, to, to conclude today's session, we have a number of pre-submitted questions. Um, I'll now ask our panel to respond and debate. Uh, the first one is, I'll direct this to James Mee, uh, how is COVID-19 impact assessed in the due diligence reports? What should the decision makers be looking out for? 
Uh, thanks, Sam. So uh, I suppose a couple of observations, really. Um, I mean, COVID has certainly impacted the deal market um, generally, as well as uh, DD reports specifically. Um, it's probably just a little bit of context. I think everybody knows that deal volumes were certainly impacted earlier in the year. Um, and I think in part that's because of a, a, everybody grappling with what the risks being presented by COVID um, were. I think it was also a factor, of course, of banks um, uh, not being so willing to lend as they were assessing risks and, and solvency and the like. Um, but deal values and volumes have certainly picked up as has been uh, has been covered earlier. So in terms of DD reports, I mean, certainly where we've seen the focus um, has been more around commercial due diligence rather than what I call sort of technical or, or, or legal um, due diligence. Um, all of the issues that we've all talked about haven't gone away because of COVID, so they're still there and very much part of due diligence exercises. Um, but the focus, the change in focus that we've seen is much more commercial due diligence being done, trying to understand the viability of um, businesses that are, are being sold, and indeed the viability of the customers and clients of those businesses. So the commercial due diligence has effectively had several, have several layers to it. And we've also seen that, that type of exercise being conducted sort of much lower down the deal value chain than we might traditionally have done. I think as uh, buyers and investors seek to properly understand what the, you know, the longer term business proposition of the business that they're looking to invest in is. Thank you. Um, the next one, this is probably, I'd say more esoteric, is how do you see the UK and Europe in general comparing with the US? Um, to Peter? Thanks, Sam. And, and I think, yeah, this is a very interesting question and, and interesting to get Leah's perspective as well, because I think traditionally the difference between the US and the UK, or Europe more generally, is around how you allocate risk between buyers and sellers. And I think the US has traditionally been seen as a, a, a jurisdiction which puts the buyer at the forefront in terms of um, benefiting from the risk provisions and SBAs around warranties and disclosure, for example. So in the US, you'd often get warranties given on an indemnity basis. In the UK, that's much more rare. In the US, the purchaser normally would be very um, keen to, to prevent the, the seller being able to have a general disclosure of data rooms or things which are in the public domain, for example. They, they put the burden of disclosure very much on the, on the seller to go through each of the warranties and specify precisely why that warranty isn't true without being able to generally disclose a vast swathe of information. So, so on the, in, in that respect, the US has always been quite keen to put the buyer at the top of the tree. Having said that, in terms of the quantum of recovery, the US has always been quite good at, at, at limiting a seller's liability to a, a much smaller proportion of the consideration. Whereas in the UK, it's not uncommon to have a 100% cap on, on a seller's liability. Often that's much lower in, in the US, you might get a, a liability cap of 10 or 20% of the, of the overall consideration. So it's interesting, the idea of using warranty and indemnity policies to, to actually bring, bridge the expectation gap between where that risk lies between a seller and a purchaser. So yeah, I think in terms of where the differences are, it's very much in, in the risks around the warranties, but perhaps the WNI policies in the future can help uh, bridge that gap going forward. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. When, when we look at where the M&A insurance products are used in the rest of the world in the US, because a US law uh, form SBA is typically much more buyer friendly, the, the insurance policy is much more insured friendly because it mirrors the form of the SBA. And when you look at your ability to recover under that type of SBA, it's much more enhanced because you don't have those, those questions of disclosure, disclosure that Peter just spoke to. But then from an insurance perspective, the products are typically twice as expensive in the US than they are in the rest of the world because we have greater transfer. Understandably, an insurer wants to be compensated with a higher level, a higher level of premiums. And I think the other point I'd make around that as well is when we look at claims activity globally in various different regions, and you have to normalize for the amount of this products used in various different regions, the level of claims that are being successfully pursued against uh, US policies 
is is quite significant is is relatively high and we really start to see start to see in the last two years as this product has been used in the in the us much more regularly for exactly those reasons around risk allocation because of that buyer friendly position in the spa the seller doesn't want to take that liability so from a seller's perspective that makes the the insurance a much more attractive proposition we're now starting to see those claims start to flow through into the the insurance market um, and I suppose the final point I'll add around that as well is what we're now seeing is because that US style form of policy is much more buyer slash insured friendly, we're now seeing a lot of European buyers or US buyers buying into Europe, structuring US style policies that whilst the SPA is still English law governed or a continental European law governed agreement, the insurers are willing to build in some of those insured beneficial dynamics, effectively meaning you can recover under the policy as if it was a US law SPA, regardless of the fact that it was, a, for example, an English law SPA. Thanks both. Um, I suppose, Leah, it really demonstrates the importance of a, a sort of global approach to combine the best of both worlds. It really does. And, you know, we, we, we looked at transactions in 54 jurisdictions last year, and there are nuances that are very relevant from an insurance placement in lots of different jurisdictions. If you go to the Netherlands, for example, and how you deal with consequential loss concepts uh, or the basis of recovery in Italy, and then the points we discussed around the US, that there are some key considerations that you need to make sure are reflected in insurance products and having that expertise is, in my view, critical. Thank you. Um, a more uh, specific question next. Um, open source came up quite a lot today, um, unsurprisingly. Uh, this one's towards David. Uh, what is a good strategy for dealing with copy left um, open source software issues discovered during the due diligence process? Um, thanks, Sam. So, so when we talk about copy left open source software, um, what that refers to is the fact that um, and there are various um, general terms that apply to the use of open soft software. And the reference to copy left has become this sort of generic uh, reference to some of the, uh, these type provisions. So it turns classic copyright on its head. So copyright is essentially saying, I am the author or creator of this code, I own it. I have the exclusive right to copy it, issue copies to the public. Copy left is saying, in effect, I have created this software, but I'm going to make it generally available to anyone who wants to use it within their own um, software, either internal systems or client facing software products. And the, the, the sting is in the tail that says, because I'm providing it to you on that basis, when you use it, you accept that anything you create using it will also be released on the same basis. And so that's the copy left. So, there are lots of, as we mentioned before now, technical due diligence solutions that go and scan across your systems and try and identify open source and then identify where they come from and what license terms uh, uh, apply. So essentially you do have to um, follow a process. So definitely good technical due diligence, particularly over a large um, software a system where that is driving value, whether in terms of internal systems or client facing. Once you've identified it, the lawyers have to assist with the review of the relevant open source public license terms to see whether those copyleft terms bite. And then really you're going back to the business and the technical teams again. And one of the key questions is where is the open source? How widely spread it is? Because if it's throughout the organization, it goes again, as we've talked a lot, we go straight to value because you really need to be saying that there is a very significant risk that you're going to have to make that software generally available. So what we often look at is things like what modules actually have it, because you might well be able to slice the proprietary software into different parts and identify those parts that might be subject to an open soft, open source software risk and which parts actually might can be isolated from it and have a break between the OSS and the proprietary code. Um, fortunately people are much more alive to this issue now. Um, what we typically see now is that open source software is used in standard algorithms or routines that people are more relaxed about 
making generally available. It's not core to the business and it's not something that the business is looking to monetize. I think that's one of the big risks is when you see software that is not just for internal purposes, but it's a business that actually seeks to exploit and create revenue from proprietary software. And that has open source embedded within it. So in summary, I think you run your technical due diligence, you identify it, you review the relevant license terms, and then you see whether you can isolate where the OSS is in fact used. And finally, see whether that will impact on value, either through the fact that you might have a dispute with one of the sort of uh, open software federations that are much more active, um, or indeed, in the worst case scenario, you might actually have to make that proprietary software generally available. Um, Leo, I know you've mentioned in your talk about the fact that insurance, again, can go to ownership of IP and source code and the like. So again, presumably that's something where in the right circumstances, insurance can answer some of those OSS risks as well. It, it does, it, it covers the, the unknown risks and this falls into the, the warranty indemnity insurance uh, type solution. So where open source software is being used in the business or there's a concern that it may be within a business's proprietary software, you'll often see for understandable reasons, a buyer seeking warranties to effectively lock in that position. Now, th those warranties are coverable, um, but they would the insurer would expect a buyer to be going through that process of technical due diligence, be it a black duck report or similar, to, to assess how much open source software is that business using and where is it used in the business. And if we've made that assessment and we're comfortable with the outcome of that assessment, that's typically where you, you can find the insurance protection around something that you don't know about. Uh, but what the insurance market won't do is, is blindly protect around that, having not dug into the detail to really understand that because it does go straight to the, to the heart of value for a business. Thanks, Leo. And yeah, I'm just wary of time. Um, thank you everyone for, for, for joining that. I just want to ask one more question on the theme of value. Uh, this one I'll direct to, to Peter. What is your view on the valuations or the very significant valuations, to be honest, that some tech companies are achieving at the moment? Thanks, Sam. And it's an interesting one because you would have expected COVID to have you know, laid ways to, to the values of all tech companies or, or a significant majority of them. But actually what we've seen is valuations of tech companies sort of around the world holding up quite strongly. And I, I think there are a few reasons for that. One is that often when you value a tech company, it's not necessarily based upon uh, sort of normal factors. There's, there's often other underlying causes that might result in a, in a tech company having a high valuation. For example, a desire to be the first mover in that particular space, be it AI or driverless cars, whatever it might be. It might also be a desire just to beat your competitors and, and therefore uh, sort of win the arms race of, of acquiring smaller companies and, and, and putting them in your stable. So, often the multiples paid on tech companies are, are higher because of those, those other factors. We saw, um, we saw Facebook buying Giphy uh, earlier this summer and, and it spent $400 million on, on that company. And that was a, a 20 times multiple of EBITDA, which is, is quite extraordinary. But clearly it's, it's, it's done that with a desire to be the first mover and, and really acquire the, the, the best uh, proposition in that space. I think we've also seen a, a lot of competition in, in the market for good tech companies. So it's not just the likes of Facebook and Google and, and all the big tech companies who are buying the smaller companies up. It's a lot of strategic key investment as well. So increasing the level of competition for the best assets clearly drives up value too. And, and finally, what I'd say is that tech companies are, are almost by definition disruptive and innovative. And so they don't necessarily suffer from the same macroeconomic uh, downward pressure uh, as other companies around around the world, so so I think the fact of tech companies having that that extra sort of innovative or disruptive factor again keeps their valuations high. So I think those are the three reasons why we might have seen valuations staying quite high in the tech world, where in other in other sectors they've fallen quite significantly. Thanks, Peter. Uh, certainly keeps all of us busy. So I'd like to thank um, you for responding to those questions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time today. Uh, for those listening, if you have any further questions,
questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch. And the team here will be more than happy to respond uh, directly to you. If I could move to the, the next slide. First of all, I'd like to thank our panel of experts for presenting to us today, as well as all of our other colleagues working hard behind the scenes to make this event happen. It's clear uh, a lot of effort was put in and it's great to see so many different perspectives. Um, I certainly learned a lot today, which I'm gonna take on. Second, on behalf of the Marsh and RPC team here today, we'd like to thank all of you, uh, registrants for joining the session. We know how busy you all must be. We really value your engagement. Uh, we'll be following up next week with a recording of a session along with a copy of the slides and also the contact details you can see here. You're more than welcome to contact us directly. Finally, I'm also delighted to announce that we'll be launching our next 2021 Global Technology Risk Survey in the coming weeks. This is your opportunity to contribute to our unique global risk study for the tech industry. We use the insights to determine our overall Marsh tech strategy and the report itself will be released to participants um, in Q1 next year. So stay posted. Thank you and goodbye everyone.